So this is, this is going to be something that's rather different <laughs> than what we've been doing the whole time, uh, which is just a, uh, this is, there's no fire, but it is a fireside chat in the traditional sense of the term, um, which is just to talk to you about your dad, whose picture's been up here. This is still up there. Um, and what, what would he have thought of this today? Well, I was saying to Perry uh, Merling, who wrote a, a book about him, yes. that I wish he could be here because, in a sense, this is like Fisher Black, this is your life. Because there's all of these colleagues from different phases all together and so many great stories about what it was like to work with him or the ramifications of his intellectual work, and I just wish he could be here. Would he be proud? Would he be embarrassed? Would he be vindicated? You know, he had kind of a, one of his qualities as a parent was this sort of neutrality where I don't think he was very, uh, he just liked to, receive information, give information. He was very loving and open, but I don't think he would have been proud necessarily, but happy to see everything that's come of his work, for sure. What was he like as a parent? He, you know, he, he wasn't very, he had kind of a free markets Approach to parenting. <laughs> what a shock! <laughs> Where rowdy in motion? Even, I, I think he, I think he figured that if you did something that wasn't a good idea, you would figure it out in short order. So he had there was a gentleness to his style of parenting, and also I think it was an extension of his personality, where he wasn't someone who located authority externally, and so. I don't think he necessarily assumed that anyone else should locate authority externally. So he was not a harsh disciplinarian. So when you, what did, what's the worst thing you did? And how did he, re, how did he respond to it? <laughs> you don't have to tell us the worst. You don't have to give us details. But. You know, to be honest, my parents had two very different parenting styles, so when I think of the worst things that I did or punishments or arguments or fights, I tend to think more of my mom because there was more friction there than with my dad. I mean, not that he never grounded us, but <laughs> he was definitely the, the softy of the two. What did he ground you for? I used to get in trouble for secretly doing my homework with a flashlight you know, under the blankets, and we weren't supposed to be up past a certain time. And, and I thought that that was sort of a virtuous crime, <laughs> and that I wouldn't really get in trouble. But no, apparently, we were supposed to go to bed when we were supposed to go to bed. So he'd come into the room to check out if there was a light under the blankets and stuff? I don't know that he would come explicitly checking, but I remember getting in trouble. Because sometimes when I got in trouble in those days, I would make a note on my wallpaper of like, I'm so, uh, who, how I got in trouble, and, and um, I wrote the quote, punishment is a useless weapon in the struggle for people's minds. <laughs> <laughs> I see, you were not. I didn't like the idea of being punished. So, but did you, did you fight with him, or I mean? Um, I don't, I don't remember fighting with him. I remember getting in trouble for that, and, and. Did you get in trouble for writing on the wall? Oh, for writing on the wall, no. Is that because it was below the bed level? I think or? it was a, it was discreet enough. It kind of blended in enough yeah. with the <laughs> pattern. So it was sneaky. It was sneaky. Sneaky writing. I, would, would he would he have been? We keep hearing about how he asked questions to which there were either no answers or both answers. Or did he do that with you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How? He always thought that things were a matter of interpretation. There were many different ways to see the same thing. Um, so I remember he and my mom having a, a fight one time about whether there was such a thing as facts. <laughs> as what? Facts. 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 F-A-C-T-S. F-A-C-T-S, yeah. And just in the sense that, is the sky blue? Well, why is it blue? Well, what happens at night? And, and that's one type of fight that they would have. I'm sure there were other dimensions for what they were discussing, but I distinctly remember them talking about that um, specifically wh whether 
there is such a thing as, as a fact. Did he drive your mom crazy that way? I mean, they didn't really see eye to eye. <laughs> <laughs> Forever? The whole time? Well, no, they were in love. They were in love in the beginning, and as sometimes happens, they became less in love over time, and they got a divorce when I was 12. Oh. Did, did the, you had three sisters, right? Yes. Melissa's in the front row right there. Oh, hey. <laughs> you should be up here. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't want to be. <laughs> Oh, there's plenty of chairs. Well, we'll, I will, I'll, I'll ask you occasional questions just to keep you in the game here. What did he punish us for? <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, we need, we need a, a mic in there. And just you keep it for a while. Oh, yeah, this is, I like the way this is turning. <laughs> I, I was going to say um, one of the ways that he woke us up in the morning is that he would come in and ask us math questions. He'd ask you math questions? Math questions. Like, that was his interpretation of if I put that spark in her brain, she'll wake up and get ready to go to school. So and what was like, a, at what age? I think it was, well, he drove us to BBNN, um, so he was the one responsible for getting us out of bed and getting us in the car. And so that was when I was in fourth, third grade and fourth grade. So what kind of math questions would he pose? I mean, at that age, it was pretty basic, like, you know, 89 divided by 9 stuff. <laughs> um, but... It, it really wasn't that basic, you know, <laughs> to do fractions. <laughs> he, he was very interested in um, thinking. He, he very much thought if your brain was working that you were awake, even if your whole body was completely <laughs> sluggish <laughs> and you were asleep. Did, so did he ask you those kind of, did he ask you math questions? Math questions, and then we would get, for Christmas, we would get science kits, you know, where you could make your own cloud. <laughs> and remember, and uh, electric, electrical kids, or, and um, sort of educational gifts. Did you? That was good. W that was good? Yeah. A, a mixture. You like to get some educational gifts and some other dolls. You got Barbies. I mean, you got, OK. I just didn't I'm relieved. Wasn't, it get. wasn't all educational gifts. But he liked to give things where you would be learning. Well, did he help with homework? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I leaned on him strongly for, and, and he, but that again, part of his personality was, you're not going to learn it unless you do it yourself. But I knew that he was so intelligent and, and especially with certain subjects, I thought, well, you should definitely help me with this. But he, he didn't uh, agree. I mean, he would help, he would show me the principles, but I, then, then I would have to apply them. And you? Um, I, I feel like he was less that way with me. I think sometimes because I didn't really ask. I was I was a little bit intimidated to ask him for help. I, there were times when I was like, you know, I I'm slightly embarrassed <laughs> that I don't really know how to do this. So I didn't really go to him very frequently for help. My next question was, were you and your sisters intimidated? I didn't feel um, intimidated per se, but I did look up to him. Um, well, as your dad, I mean. Yeah. I mean, I felt very close to him. So I didn't. Well, you, were, you said he was like your best friend. Yeah, he was my best friend. So you're not going to be intimidated by your, your best friend. Your best friend, yeah. And, and he was your best friend because you, he was that reliable. You knew he loved you that much. He was not. Uh, you know, volatile, to use a word that's come up a lot today. Yeah, I mean, he was a, a very, very reliable and gentle-spirited. I was fighting a lot with my mom. Um, so she was the policewoman. She was the, she was the police, police person. Yeah. She was more the micromanager style, and he was more that, I'm going to trust you to figure this out. And... Um, and I just trusted him and leaned on him, especially during those years when you're fighting a lot, sometimes with your same sex parent. And then, and especially since they were split, then I could, he, he could be a counter voice to that voice. So, but he was a good friend. You know, he, a lot of times today people are very, um, 
they, they make a, a big part of, they spend a lot of their time judging others and saying this is right and this is wrong and he's good and she's bad. And he wasn't very uh, judgmental in that way. He, you know, sometimes that's so draining and it's so much more relaxing if someone, if, if there's someone in traffic and they're leaning on their horn and leaning on their horn and leaning on their horn instead of someone saying, oh, what a jerk, say, someone saying, oh, maybe he's having a really stressful day today. And I found that he was more in the latter camp, like he, he didn't waste energy judging trivial things. And I really respond to that in terms of my personality. So that was a good fit. And also he was so utterly unconcerned with likes and getting the approval of the crowd. You know, today so much energy is about social media and getting likes and truly what is less meaningful than that. And he didn't have any interest in that. He never catered to that. Uh, and that was refreshing and that was a wonderful example. And I still uh, try to follow that example now. I say it does. You know, it, it truly doesn't matter if you get likes, if you're popular. I don't understand why they give headcounts at funerals. Life is not a popularity contest. And all of the social media teaching the younger generation that getting likes is so important was really anathema to his philosophy. But I'm sure we'll we'll get past it. But that's. That's the cultural moment right now, it seems. So. What, 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 how would he have responded to getting the Nobel Prize? Would it have not been that a big, no, a big a deal? No, I think he would have, it would have been a big deal. It was a big deal, and I think he would have found it to be a big deal and would have been thrilled. So it's not that he didn't want recognition of any kind. No, he just wasn't motivated by it. He thought the work was its own reward. Yeah, uh, the philosopher Robert Nozick, uh, when he died, his son uh, spoke at, at the memorial service. He said when, when he was a little kid and, ki and boys would say, my father's the strongest person in the world, he would say, my father's the smartest person in the world. Uh, and then he said, and then I grew up and found out I was right. <laughs> uh, the, did you grow up at some, did, was there a point at which you went, wait a second, this guy was, he wasn't just, a smart dad, he was a real outlier intellectually. You know, I never really thought of him as like the smartest person in the world, but I, I remember he told a great story once about a, a setting similar to this, and someone in the crowd raised their hand and said, if you're so smart, how come you're not rich? And he said, if you're so rich, how come you're not smart? <laughs> so I, he was flippant about it. I don't think he... Um, was too invested in, in any labels, including that one. But of course, he was very smart, but I didn't think of him as the smartest guy that, in the world or anything. Wasn't, it wasn't like, oh my God, my yeah. dad and everybody else. No, no. Paul Samuelson used to get ac accused of, of having said that. And I once heard him say, no, no, Milton Friedman said that, <laughs> not me. <laughs> um, when did you, if ever, learn about options? Oh, when did we, I'm gonna ask Melissa that one. <laughs> Melissa, when, when did, did we I, learn about options? I actually have a great story about this. Excellent. I majored in Hispanic studies. Can everybody hear her? Okay, good. I majored in Hispanic studies at Harvard and uh, where dad had studied. And um, he was so thrilled by the idea that I was majoring in Spanish, it was hysterical. But one day I came back to my dorm room and I found you know, a long, envelope where he had very carefully clipped out a, a translation of his original 1973 paper in Spanish. <laughs> and I literally said out loud, I do not understand this in English. <laughs> How would I possibly understand this in Spanish? So, and I, I actually would say I did not realize that my dad had a specific, um, I don't know the exact word, where he had a, a specific, you know, standing amongst people who were considered very smart until I was in college and I did hear people who were finance majors say, oh my God, your dad is Fisher Black. And that was shocking to me that there was such a niche 
appreciation for him because that wasn't, it didn't, much like she said, he was so loving and attentive. And as a parent, he was very tuned into you as a human being. And, you know, a lot of the characters that you see on TV now of people who are extraordinarily smart don't have that kind of ability to be expressive and loving and connected. But he really did. Like, he really was one of those people who showed how much he loved you. Did, did, he, did he ever talk about these guys? Say it again? Did he ever talk about these guys? Oh, these guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and they were friends. And uh, he and Myron had a famous bet about who would walk first between Anne and, and me because they both had, it was, she's your first child. Yeah, they both had, had their first children, daughters, a month apart. So I was June, born in June of 1969. Anne was May of 1969, and they were putting wagers on our walkability. Wait a second, uh, yeah. uh, actual money wagers? I, Is that, well, here we have the, the one side of the bet here, yeah? Oh, you got, uh, hand him the mic there. Oh, sorry. I mean, I was going to win the bet. There was no way about it until Fisher won the bet. Then he immediately got in his car and drove from his home with, with Alethea in the car, and she walked in front of me so I would have to pay off the bet. <laughs> so, how, how, much, how much was the bet? Real dollars? Well, no, no. Let's, inflation dollars. <laughs> as a percentage of GDP. How's that? <laughs> Well, you have to, but, but, Mike, yeah. No, it's bragging rights because he did really enjoy and love his daughters, and his family was so important to him, and it was great glory in being able to uh, do that and describe them. And all through time, you know, that was a great appreciation, which I really respected. Did you, did, did, he keep, did you guys keep making bets on, like, when they would first talk or when they would... First run or ride a gonna, bike? I'm not stupid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's clear. I, mean, <laughs> I see. <laughs> How did you get the name Aletheia? So, so it's the Greek word for truth. And because he was interested in truth, I thoroughly believed, probably for two decades, that it was for that reason that I had the name Aletheia. And at cocktail parties, people would say, oh, Heidegger writes about your name, and it's the truth as it is revealed. It's this specific kind of truth. And I was like, tell me more. And then my mother overheard me one time and said, oh, no, we got your name from a TV show. <laughs> Judd for the defense. Judd for the Judd defense. Judd for the defense. I don't know how many people were around in 68, 69, but apparently she was pregnant and he she and he were watching t television together and one of the actresses Alethea Stone they li they liked the name Alethea and they chose it for that reason uh, how did you get your name uh, my name means honeybee I think it was either going to be Melissa or Allison um, so I think it was just sort of an alliterative moment where they liked the sound of the name you got no nobody from Maverick or some <laughs> right. Well, Ed it, Sullivan show. <laughs> it was incredibly important to my mom to have unusual names. So Ashley is the next daughter, and uh, in those days, Ashley was a male name, you know, especially from Gone with the Wind. And so she thought she was being quite adventurous naming a girl Ashley. And then, of course, we all know what happened to the name Ashley, <laughs> and she didn't love that there were you know, two million Ashleys who came in the next five years. And then Paige is the youngest, and her name means child in Greek. But again, I think it was just, they just liked the way it sounded, especially, we all got family middle names, but our first names were all um, unusual, ones that they hadn't really heard before, or ones that they liked how it sounded. I feel like you should come right here, first of all. Come on up here. Yeah, and good. second of all, the, the other interesting thing about our names is they, have, uh, they descend in syllables. And so it's Alethea, Melissa. I don't think this was intentional, but it's Alethea, Melissa, Ashley, and Paige. And so sometimes people say, well, you couldn't have had any more kids. You ran out of syllables. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, how did 
how did he shape your careers and, and your lives? You've talked a little bit about how he cert cert a little more than a little bit about how he shaped, shaped your life, your life. But uh, how did he shape your life and career? I mean, Spanish? What, why Spanish? I mean, or does that have nothing to do with him? Uh, he was very, very interested in people um, taking long, circuitous routes to finding what was the best for them. Like I do, I do remember at one point we were. I was talking about how I wasn't really sure what I should do. I was thinking about medical school because I'd wanted that for a long time, and I worked in New York. And I came back, and I was adrift, as a lot of twenty-year-olds are, and. He said, you really should just take the adventures that are put in front of you. And I have, I definitely took that to heart. I had a very random walk career. And- um, Which is what? I went to business school. Well, I went to Stanford and I, I took a class <laughs> with Professor Schultz. And um, I, I, I loved academia and I loved being in school. And then I had four daughters myself. Really? So, yeah, I replicated my family. So I have four girls. And um, I kept thinking it was going to be a boy eventually, but apparently the odds are pretty stacked. Once you have two girls, you're more, much more likely to have another girl. And then if you have a third girl, you're very likely to have another girl. So, um, so that was my primary job for a long time. And then yeah. I started... Um, I was an entrepreneur. I started my own business, and I did that for almost ten years until COVID. And you know, now I'm trying to figure out what the '50s will bring for me. And of course, uh, Alethea is a published. Well, she's going to tell us that in author. a second. So yes. Yeah, so your career. How did? Uh, oh yeah, you've got, got your her. mic on. Yeah, no, I forgot. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so how did he influence your career? Well, um, we were both writers, and Perry was reminding me earlier that he, part of his writing style came from coming up through computer programming. So he was always trying, to, his style was very distinctive, very simple, because it, he wanted to be understood on multiple platforms hmm. and to be able to be uh, very fluid and, and applicable. So almost like when you write a program and you have to think about how it's going to execute. And I thought, oh, that's a great point. He did have that very uh, distinctive style of, you can tell he was trying to distill it down to its essence. So um, I also became a writer, a, a fiction writer, and I had a book of short stories come out in 2011 and a second book in 2018. And since then, I've, I've even been writing some nonfiction, and it's the nonfiction that reminds me the most of his path because I write about things that seem uh, exotic on the surface. And you know, my, I had an article come out last month, Fisher Black and Artificial Superintelligence, in which I'm arguing something that many people in tech have been saying for a long time and many people in physics have been saying for a long time, which is, are we sure we should view the universe through a materialist lens as matter? Maybe we should view the universe as information. And if you do that, how does that change the equations? If we think of the universe as a speeding train, what is matter? Well, matter is a way of seeing. Matter is, is the departure state, the station of departure. So from matter's perspective, the universe is accelerating and expanding. And energy, too, is a way of, say, of seeing. Energy is the perspective of the arriving station. So from energy's perspective, the universe is condensing. But between the two, there's a third perspective, which is that of the train itself. But the train doesn't perceive its own speed. Right when you're, uh, speed requires a frame of reference. So when you're on the train, you can get up and walk around just like you would in your living room. And that, you know, I'm trying to say that's maybe a better model for how we should think about time. Is time like this train that has a speed, but we don't always perceive it when we're one with it? 
And is it something that can, whose speed can be perceived in different ways? And is the speed of time the missing link in understanding our illnesses from cancer to Parkinson's to ALS? Now that's great to have theories and think abstractly, but if we're gonna do it the Fisher Black way, then you have to then say, well, what would this look like in a practical sense? How would you apply this in the real world? And so I say, well, let, <laughs> what would this mean? This is very abstract. And I say, well, let's look at the pineal gland, this crystal at the center of the brain that reads vibration and reads light and sets their circadian rhythm. It's the font of the neuroendocrine cascade. It's extremely important. But what is the density of the light with which I'm reading light's density? Are, and that that come that kind of thinking that that thinking that I think we're probably I'll speak only for myself that I'm ha and I've heard you talk about this before but still having trouble keeping up with or even getting my mind around what you're talking about. But th that's that comes from the kind of open questioning that your dad was doing you're nodding yeah yeah i th my my take on the way um you know so many people have spoken about his classes and how the nature of the 50 questions and how they were just um very simple yet very complex and he had you know each class is the question is one big question um, he really took that to almost every other version of himself, you know, of the family man, the, the husband, the son, you know, he really was about um, openness and communication and, you know, freedom. And he wanted to, I wouldn't even say it was he wanted to push the boundaries. It was just, he liked experiences and he he liked adventures like he was I described him I think it at um one of the memorial services as he was tilting at windmills like not not in the sense that it was not that he wasn't completely secure in his mind but in the sense that he really had this adventurous um playful playful mm -hmm. yeah well that's good yeah he it was just, the positive side of Don Quixote. Yes. Yeah. He was very playful, and um, he had uh, he had the best laugh. Like when he was really he, he had an easy laugh, which I got kind of spoiled on. So I thought for a while that I was funny, because he would just throw his head back and guffaw with this wonderful laugh and slap his leg, and mm -hmm. just was very. He's a literal thigh slapper. Yes. It, and I'm double sure. over. He would uh, double he would, uh, over. Laughter. Yeah. He laughed and sometimes going to this silent laugh. He would laugh with his whole body. Yeah. It was just great. He was really great. I have one, I, Perry Merling is here uh, and uh, wrote a biography of, of uh, your dad, uh, a, a, a substantial biography of your dad mm -hmm. and a fascinating biography. Uh, does this all comp and can we just get somebody to have a uh, mic on Perry here? Thank you very much. You stay. I'll come to you. Uh, um, any 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 response to this? Does this correspond? Anything you're learning new? Is this this is this your view of him? Well, th this is this is more than is in the book. Okay, because for me, I can admit this now to Alethea, who is the literary executor. Okay, um, the. Uh, I wanted to write a story about the rise of modern finance, okay? And I hung it on this guy who I chose very deliberately because of his breadth, because of his imagination, because you'll hear, I'm gonna say some things at dinner about this too. So he seemed the right person, you know, for telling this large story. Um, I also would basically got a, got a PhD in finance just by reading everything he ever wrote. You know, I never mm -hmm. took a course in finance, but I had to learn it all you know, in English, not in Spanish. <laughs> um, but, but there was one thing that I wanted to, uh, one anecdote maybe that will will speak to this. Um, so when I contacted Alethea, okay, about, hey, I wanna write this biography um, and I'm gonna need some sign-offs, some permissions, you mm -hmm. know, to use papers and private papers. There, there were like 50 boxes of papers in MIT. And, uh, and when I saw them, I said, oh, I can do this whole thing 
this, there's a lot here. You know, I can write a book. She said that she had asked a number of her friends, and they said, "Well, you should make sure that you get sign off on the copy, and that you should, you know, that you can you can critique the the." And and she said, and I thought, what would my dad do? And and she said, it, it breaks me up a little bit. She said he would say, "Go for it." And so she just signed. That was it. She gave me freedom. Well, that's a perfect way to end the whole session. So thank you all for coming up. <laughs>